So in the last lecture, we executed this piece of JavaScript code inside of a browser. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how to run the same code in Node. So I'm assuming that you have installed Node on your machine. If not, head over to nodejs.org and download the latest version of Node. Now, if you're on Windows, open up Command Prompt. If you're on Mac, open up Terminal and head over to the folder you created earlier. Now in this folder, we run Node and pass the name of our JavaScript file, that is index.js. We get the same message on the console. So you can see Node is a program that includes Google's V8 JavaScript engine. We can give it a piece of JavaScript code and it will execute that code for us, just like how we can execute some JavaScript code in a browser. So Node is a runtime environment for executing JavaScript code. Now let me show you a tip. Here in VS Code, we have an integrated terminal. So you don't have to explicitly open up a separate terminal window. So here on the top, under the view menu, look, we have integrated terminal. Note the shortcut here. That's the shortcut for Mac. On Windows, you're going to have a different shortcut. So select this. And here's our integrated terminal pointing to the same folder where we created our files. So you don't have to explicitly navigate to this folder. And here we can run node index.js as well. Now in this course, we're not going to work with node anymore because node is a completely separate topic. In programming, we use a variable to store data temporarily in a computer's memory. So we store our data somewhere and give that memory location a name. And with this name, we can read the data at the given location in the future. Here's a metaphor. Think of the boxes you use to organize your stuff. You put your stuff in various boxes and put a label on each box. With this, you can easily find your stuff, right? A variable is like a box. What we put inside the box is the value that we assign to a variable, that's the data. And the label that we put on the box is the name of our variable. Now let's see this in code. So here in index.js, I'm going to declare a variable. Now, previously in the old days, before ES6, we used the var keyword to declare a variable. But there are issues with var as you will find out later in the course. So going forward from ES6, the best practice is to use the let keyword to declare a variable. Now we need to give this variable a name or an identifier. And this is like the label we put on a box. So I'm going to call this name. And finally, we need to terminate this declaration with a semicolon. Now let's log this on the console and see what we get. So console.log name. Once again, we need to terminate this statement with a semicolon. Save the changes. And here in the console, we see undefined. So by default, variables that we define in JavaScript, their value is undefined. Now we can optionally initialize this variable. So I'm going to set this to a string, which is a sequence of characters like mosh. Note that I'm using single quotes. You can also use double quotes. Different developers have different preferences, but it's more common to use single quotes for declaring strings in JavaScript. Now, when we save the changes, instead of undefined, we see mosh on the console. So here in this example, we have declared a variable called name, and we have set that to this value, to this string. Now, we have a few rules for naming these variables. Here are the rules. First is that they cannot be a reserved keyword. So in JavaScript, we have reserved keywords. Let is one of them. You also have if, else, var, and so on. Now, you don't have to memorize this list. If you try to use one of these names, you're going to get an error. For example, if I change this to if, note this red underline. This is indicating that this is not a valid identifier. Okay, so we wrote it back. Now, the second rule is that they should be meaningful. We want to have meaningful names, like meaningful labels. I've seen developers using names like A or B or A1 or I don't know, X. These variable names do not give us any clue. What is the purpose of these variables? What kind of data are we storing at that memory location? So always use meaningful and descriptive names. Okay, now back to name. The third rule 
is that they cannot start with a number. So we cannot have a variable like one name. But again, going back to the second rule, why would you want to call a variable one name? It's meaningless, right? So always use meaningful names. The fourth rule is that they cannot contain a space or hyphen. So if you have multiple words, you need to put them together. Here is an example. Let's imagine we want to declare a variable called first name. So first name and note that here i'm using camel notation so the first letter of the first word should be lowercase and the first letter of every word after should be uppercase this is what we call camel notation which is the convention we use in javascript to name our variables another thing you need to know about these variable names is that they are case sensitive so if i declare another variable call it first name, but make the F uppercase. These two variables are different. But as I told you before, if you stick to camel notation, you wouldn't end up with a variable name like this. And finally, the last thing you need to know about these variables is that if you want to declare multiple variables, there are two ways to do this. You can declare them on one line and separate them using a comma. So first name and then last name. Now in this case, I have not initialized either of these variables. They're both undefined. I can optionally initialize one or both of them. So I can set this to Mosh and I can leave last name undefined or set it to my last name, Hamadani. But the modern best practice is to declare each variable on a single line. So we terminate this first declaration with a semicolon and declare the second variable on a new line. That's the modern best practice. Next, we're going to look at constants. All right, now let's declare a variable called interest rate. So let interest rate, and we set this to 0.3. Now this is the initial value. We can always change that later. So we can set interest rate to, let's say one. Now, if you log this on the console, of course, we're going to see the new value, right? So save the changes, and here's one on the console. However, in a real-world application, there are situations that we don't want the value of a variable to change, because otherwise, it's going to create all kinds of bugs in our application. In those situations, instead of a variable, we use a constant. So the value of a variable, as the name implies, can change, but the value of a constant cannot change. So here, if we change let to const, now interest rate will be a constant. So when I save the changes, you're going to see an error in the console on line three where we reassign interest rate. So let's have a look. Save the changes, and here's the error. On cut, type error, assignment to constant variable. You can see this error happen in index.js line three. Now, if you click here, you can see the line in code where this error occurred. So we cannot reassign a constant. All right, now back to the console. So here's the best practice. If you don't need to reassign, constant should be your default choice. Otherwise, if you need to reassign a variable, use let. So you have learned how to declare and initialize a variable. Now you might be wondering, what are the kind of values that we can assign to a variable? Well, you have seen strings, but we have more types. Basically in JavaScript, we have two categories of types. On one side, we have primitives, also called value types. On the other types, we have reference types. In this lecture, we're going to focus on primitives and you're going to learn about reference types later in the course. Now, in the category of primitives, we have strings, numbers, booleans, undefined, and null. Let's look at each of these in action. So here we have a variable called name, which is set to a string. What we have here is what we call a string literal. That's just a fancy name for a string. Now let's declare a variable and set it to a number. So let age, we set that to 30. 
And by the way, I'm not 30 years old, but don't tell anyone, okay? So this is what we call a number literal. Now let's declare a Boolean. A Boolean can be either true or false. So let is approved to be true. This is what we call a Boolean literal. And we use this in situations where we want to have some logic. For example, if the order is approved, then it needs to be shipped. So the value of a Boolean variable can be true or false. And by the way, note that both true and false are reserved keywords, so they cannot be variable names. Okay, now you have seen undefined before, so I can declare another variable, first name. If we don't initialize it, by default, its value is undefined. But we can also explicitly set this to undefined. But that's not very common. In contrast, we have another keyword that is null. So let me declare another variable and set this to null. We use null in situations where we want to explicitly clear the value of a variable. For example, we may want to present the user with a list of colors. If the user has no selection, we want to set the selected color variable to null. In the future, if the user selects a color, then we're going to reassign this variable to a color like red. And then if they click red again, perhaps we want to remove the selection. So we set this back to null. So we use null in situations where we want to clear the value of a variable. So these are the examples of primitives or value types. We have strings, numbers, booleans, undefined, and null. Now in ES6, we have another primitive that is symbol, and you're going to learn about that later in the course. One thing that separates JavaScript from a lot of programming languages is that JavaScript is a dynamic language. What do I mean by dynamic? Well, we have two types of programming languages, static languages or dynamic languages. In static languages, when we declare a variable, the type of that variable is set and it cannot be changed in the future. In a dynamic language like JavaScript, the type of a variable can change at runtime. Let's see this in code. So back in the example from the last lecture, we have declared this name variable and we have set that to a string. So the type of name is currently a string, but it can change in the future. Let's take a look. So here in the console, we can execute some JavaScript code. We have this type of operator and with that we can check the type of a variable so after that we add the name of the variable in this case our name variable so note that the type of name is a string now if we reassign name to a different value like a number and check its type look the type is now changed to a number this is what we call a dynamic language so unlike static languages the type of these variables will be determined at runtime based on the values that we assign to them. Now let's take a look at a few more examples of the type of operator. And by the way, note that type of is another reserved keyword, so you cannot have a variable called type of. So we can clear the console by pressing Control and L. So now let's take a look at type of age. It's a number. Now if we change age, to a floating point number, and I know it doesn't make sense, but let's just stick to this for this example. 30.1, and then look at type of age. It's still a number. So in JavaScript, unlike other programming languages, we don't have two kinds of numbers. We don't have floating point numbers and integers. All numbers are of type number. Now let's look at the type of is approved. It's a Boolean, as I told you before. What about the first name? Let's have a look. Type of first name. It's undefined. And that's funny because the value of this variable is undefined, but its type is also undefined. What does this mean? Well, earlier I told you that we have two categories of types. We have primitives or value types and reference types. In the primitive types category, we have strings, numbers, booleans, undefined, and null. So undefined is actually a type, but it's also a value. In this example, because we have set 
first name to undefined as a value, its type is also undefined. Okay. Now, what about selected color? Let's have a look. So type of selected color. The type of this variable is an object. What is an object? That's the topic for the next lecture. So you have seen all the primitive types in JavaScript. Now let's take a look at the reference types. In the reference types category, we have objects, arrays, and functions. In this lecture, we're going to explore objects and you will learn about arrays and functions later in this section. So what is an object? An object in JavaScript and other programming languages is like an object in real life. Think of a person. A person has name, age, address, and so on. These are the properties of a person. We have the same concept in JavaScript. So when we're dealing with multiple related variables, we can put these variables inside of an object. For example, here we have two variables, name and age, they're highly related. They are part of the representation of a person. So instead of declaring two variables, we can declare a person object. And then instead of referencing these two different variables, we can just reference the person object. It makes our code cleaner. So let's see how we can declare a person object. We start with let or const if we don't want to reassign the person object and set it to an object literal. So this syntax we have here, these curly braces, is what we call an object literal. Now, between these curly braces, we add one or more key value pairs. So the keys are what we call the properties of this object. In this case, we want this person object to have two properties or two keys, name and age. So we add name here. That's the key. Then we add a colon and after that, we set the value. So mosh. Now we add a comma and add another key value pair, age 30. So now we have a person object with two properties or two key value pairs, name and age. And with that, we don't need these two variables. Now let's log person on the console. So console.log person. Save the changes. So here's our person object. Again, note the object literal syntax. So we have curly braces and in between them we have one or more key value pairs. And these are the properties of the person object. Now, there are two ways to work with these properties. Let's say we want to change the name of this person. So we need to access the name property. There are two ways. The first way is what we call the dot notation. So we add the name of our object, in this case, person, dot. Now you can see its properties. We have age and name. So we can change the value of name to John. Now we can use the dot notation to also read the value of a property. So here on line 10, instead of logging the person object, we can log its name property. Now save the changes, and in the console we get John. The other way to access a property is using bracket notation. So bracket notation. So instead of dot, we use square brackets and we pass a string that determines the name of the target property. So single or double quotes, but single quotes are more common. The name of the target property is name. So we can change that to, let's say, Mary. Again, when reading that, we can use the dot notation or the bracket notation. If we save the changes, now we get Mary on the console. Now you might be asking, which approach is better, dot notation or bracket notation? Well, as you can see, dot notation is a bit more concise, it's shorter, so that should be your default choice. However, bracket notation has its own uses. Sometimes you don't know the name of the target property until the runtime. For example, in our user interface, the user might be selecting the name of the target property. In that case, at the time of writing code, we don't know what property we're going to access. That is going to be selected at runtime by the user. So we might have another variable somewhere else, like selection, 
that determines the name of the target property that the user is selecting and that can change at runtime with this we can access that property using the bracket notation in a dynamic way so we pass selection here and we get the same result okay now if this is confusing don't worry you're going to see this again in the future as you gain more experience with javascript for now just stick to the dot notation because that's cleaner and easier next we're going to look at arrays i hope you find out this video useful if you like this video then give it a like share this video if you find out this video useful if you think that if something is missing in this video or you want us to cover some other content related to programming languages technology or anything then do comment down we will work on that and don't forget to visit to our playlist section you will find some interesting content there subscribe our channel and hit the bell icon thanks for watching